Tansikina Felicia Gay Sniga Asut. I'm from Cumberland House, Saskatchewan, and currently I am curatorial fellow here at the Mackenzie Art Gallery. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to Power Lines, the work of Norval Morisot. This is a project that I had curated prior, so this is the second iteration of my curatorial project with Norval Morisot's work. And what's so special about this collection is that, you know, it contains not only Norval's work, it contains uh, some of his ephemera that you'll be able to see here, like his jacket, uh, headdress, a skull, you know, things that you wouldn't probably think of Nor as Norval Morisot works. Norval Morisot is uh, Anishinaabe from Northern Ontario, and I myself am Swampy Cree from Northern Saskatchewan. And what I noticed right away when I was looking at the Westerkirk art collection was the similarities within the iconography. And what I mean by iconography is we had similar story narratives, um, we had similar beings within our stories like the Thunderbird, Mr. Pissu, and mermaids. I knew right away that if I was to bring the work here to Saskatchewan, that Cree people here um, would readily recognize that iconography, and that really excited me. Another thing I really noticed that, that I felt really strongly about as a parent was the way Norval had highlighted kinships and family and how he honoured his children. I think that's really important for people to see how Indigenous people culturally view children, their wives, their relatives, and the concept of relatives goes far beyond human, it's also non-human. The concept of relationality, which is a common thread amongst many First Nations all across Turtle Island is where we're all related to all living beings. So that could be, you know, the trees, that could be animals, sky beings, water beings. That is also something that Norval really pushed forward within his narratives. You're going to see how he had evolved in concepts of spirituality. His belief system evolved, the stories evolved, the narratives evolved. Lines can mean many different things depending on how Norval painted them. So for example, if you see wavy lines coming out of someone's mouth or emitting from their body, those are lines of power, lines of ceremony or prophecy. You'll often also see lines connecting different creatures, whether it's from man to bear. And those are all concepts of communication and relationality. You'll also see circles that are split and those represent the duality of life. So it could be, you know, young and old, Old, life and death, good and evil, and so on. So every little tidbit within the work has a meaning, and it is a you know an indigenous methodology of the visual. I find that what's often shown about Norval is his really colorful works, and I really wanted to showcase some of Norval's earlier works because it really speaks to where he was coming from when he first began as an artist. A lot of people don't know that, you know, Norval was raised by his grandparents, his maternal grandparents, and this is also a tradition among Swampy Cree people is that the eldest grandchild is often taken care of by the maternal grandparents, and this was a way to transfer knowledge. And so Norval's uh, grandparents, his grandfather Potan, was actually a Mede uh, shaman. The Mede society would often use what was called these birch bark scrolls, similar to something like this. Um, not exactly, but it kind of alludes to what a birch bark scroll would have looked like. And within these scrolls were these narratives that were drawn upon or etched in. You know, Norval was one of these types that loved art, he loved to draw. He was drawing out the imagery that uh, was seen on these Medean scrolls. It was said that his community told him, you can't draw these images, they are not for public. You do not have the right to draw out these images. So Norval stopped. But then what occurred, as what happens in many northern communities during that time, and even now, is that there was uh, TB. TB was rampant. You know, there was a lot of overcrowding and the disease spread easy, especially in northern communities. Norval was actually very, very sick. He um, nearly died. He was dying, in fact. It was said his grandmother brought in a medicine woman to give him a new name, a naming ceremony. And what this naming ceremony would do, it would relay the power within the name onto Norval so that he could survive. 
Within the sky world, the most powerful being is the Thunderbird. And the component of copper is also very much revered amongst many different nations as a healing metal. His new name became Copper Thunderbird. So that's why the exhibition is called Copper Thunderbird in Anishinaabe and then power lines the work of Norval Morisot. So after the naming ceremony, he actually survived and he owes it to this naming ceremony and being called Copper Thunderbird because it was such a powerful name. And it is also said that after this uh, ceremony, Norval saw himself as a shaman after that because his name was so powerful. So he felt he did have the right to create this imagery. This is where we see Norval as someone kicking down doors, not only within contemporary art and in Canada, but also within his own community and evolving the standards within his own community. So one of the creatures that really interested me within his work is called, he calls it Mishipishu. And in Cree, we call it Mistipisu. Mistipisu means big lynx. And this creature actually lived in the water and it was huge, like a giant, giant lynx. And it had like um, scales, like a fish. And you know, this creature was very powerful. It would cause storms and waves. And if you found someone who had drowned, if their canoe was tipped a certain way, then you would know it was Mishtipishu. And I wanted like Cree people from this territory to say, hey, I know that, I know that creature, I know that story, you know? And I really wanted these um, pieces to cause conversation amongst people that actually know these stories. So that was like uh, something that was quite important to me as well. I would probably describe Norval as someone who was uh, very spiritual, deeply affected by the spiritual world. You know, it may have begun with his bearing with his grandfather. You know, his grandfather was very traditional and his grandmother was very religious. She was a good Catholic, but she also believed in the old ways as well. And I kind of see that how I've curated the work is like I've showed different ways that Norval looked at the spiritual throughout his life. And he had a decades-long career, and we can really clearly see where his beliefs evolved a bit. So when Norval was five, he was forced to attend residential school. You know, during that time, obviously, he had a lot of trauma, and that trauma was something that he carried throughout his whole life. Oftentimes, our people, you know, are on this healing journey, and the use of his art, I really believe, was a way or a conduit for him to explore and think around how the spiritual can affect his life and heal him. The fact that this record of his life through his paintings and ephemera are here is a, you know, a real testimony to him. So I think a part of curatorial work is also, you know, the curator is trying to tell a story through the artist. And because Norval isn't, you know, alive, I had to really glean to what I know as an Indigenous person and not try to speak for Norval, but speak with him and also speak to my community. So I just want to thank everyone that listened to what I had to say. I truly believe that you will find and experience um, something for yourself within this work. And I'm really pleased that it's here in Saskatchewan. And I hope that you enjoyed. <laughs>